Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. Today, we'll be discussing about process-based auditing, part one, and next week, we will follow up with part two. My name is Artilamana, the PCB organizer of this webinar, and the guest for today is David Smart, PCB certified trainer and managing director of Smart ISO Systems slash Smart Mentoring. Please write your questions and comments in the chat box on the right-hand control panel, or jot them down if you would like to, to these questions to be answered in the part two session coming up next week. Please, David, you may start your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to break this presentation down into two sessions, as it was a bit large, so we'll Welcome everybody, whether it be morning, afternoon or evening, depending on what, what the world you're in. So let's move on to the second slide, which is what is an audit? In simple terms, you're comparing the objective practice against the documented procedures. If there's a difference, it's called a non-conformance. Now there's two ways that non-conformances can happen. The first is the, what I call a lagging non-conformance. This happens because either the observed practice is lagging behind the document procedure. This happens because of complacency, doing the job repeatedly, demotivation, or being pressured into doing the job quicker and taking shortcuts. Another way is a new manager deliberately circumventing in the quality management system or any other uh, standard that you're auditing and imposing his own ideas on everybody. The second way nonconformance happen is leading nonconformance. This happens when a better way of doing the job has been found. The their practice is in advance of the documented procedure. The problem is that either the person does not know how to ask for a change or is just lazy and can't be bothered. Now I want to talk a little bit now about the changes, especially in ISO 9001. Now, while I've said and used the term documented procedures in the first part of this slide, I want to point out that there's now a tendency to have less documentation and rely more on interviews and using triangulation to ensure that the working practices meet the particular standard being audited. Now, what I mean by triangulation, I know you'll not you'll struggle to do it in a very small company, but if you've got, for example, three operatives doing the same job, three sales guys, three production operatives, whatever, <clears throat> then you can go and ask them how they do that particular task and compare it and see if you get all the same answer and the same method. That's what I mean by triangulation. Now we're going to talk about a six-step approach to process auditing. The first part of it is what does your organization do? Now ISO 9001, excuse me, 2015 defines product as a result of a process. There are four kinds of product. First one is manufactured goods. I've used examples of uh, oil rigs, cars, fridges, etc. Next one is processed items, chemical and food. The third one is software programs. And the last one is service activities. And I've just given two or three examples there. Transport, taxis, solicitors, etc. Now, I've taken the bank here as an example. Because everybody uses banks and has dealings with a bank. So, this is a first level troll showing the two main functions in the bank. The first one is managing money.
And within the, the processes for managing money as the bank receives and makes cash transactions. Second one is the process checks. And the third one is the provide statements. Now another function of the bank is to make loans. They provide business loans and they provide personal loans. Now the organization function, this is simplified to illustrate the method to determine what an organization done. In the next slide we will take the top header managing money and see how the money management processes tied together as a process group. A process is a sequence of related tasks triggered by an event and intended to achieve an objective. An event can be an action, a thought, a decision or a diary date. So the, bo the process can both be reactive and proactive. A reactive example would be the responding to a sales inquiry, a proactive example would be recruiting new staff by seeing the need beforehand. Again, the process uses resources and subject to influences. All processes consume resources and are subject to being influenced by a number of factors. And an example of a resource would be the people employed in it and the influencers would be the policies <coughs> to run the process. So we'll now go on and look at a generic process model. Now every process has an input and an output, at least one, and they don't have to match up. You can have, for instance, say three inputs and one output, or one input and three outputs or whatever combination at all. And every process has a transformation. Between the inputs and the outputs, something is to transform into something. Value is added to the product, or at least it should be. And also, you'll see the top part of feeding in, uh, we need controls and processes. Examples of controls are the checks and balances, and uh, I'm going to use an example of some documented or documented information, as I now call it, in uh, the 2015 version of 9000. Root cards, work orders, drawn dimensions. And the bottom box in green there talks about the resources. One way to look at resources is to use four M's. Men, money, machines and materials. We can take them one at a time and break them down into sub-categories. Men, their present competencies, induction to the job, future training needs. This is followed by compiling a checklist of questions around each subcategory to ask during the audit interview. Now, the process model example I'm going to use, again, everybody understands about cows and it's simple for people to understand. Anybody that's a boy racer in an organization, we can use the same analogy but use internal combustion engine. But back to the cow model, because it's green and et cetera, et cetera. So we can see the cow eats grass, and the transformation is the cow mastigates the grass in its stomach, and then we've got two outputs. The main output is the milk, and then usually somebody bursts out laughing, and I'll say, that's right, cow parts. So, we're talking about how efficient your quality or any standard or any system, management system that you've got, how efficient it is and how effective it is. So now looking at a group, a process group. It consists of a number of single processes, for example operations linked together. And usually the output from the previous process will feed into the input 
or the next process. But the, the, if there's errors in the, the uh, output from the previous step, then there'll be knock-on effects to the next process. The concept I'm speaking about here is internal customer concept, where you don't put on your task until it is in a state that you would have liked to receive it. Put yourself in the receiver's position and define a set of criteria, contract conditions you impose on yourself that you would be proud to be associated with, then work to them. Too often, especially where people are under pressure or an incentive scheme is involved, <clears throat> then the tendency is just to toss the work over your shoulder and let someone else inherit it and fix it. So we're going to go back to the box process again. So there is the box money making process. As I said in the previous slide, we have only taken the money ma ma sorry, managing process and teased it out. We could have done exactly the same with the loads processes. Now again, it's a, the, the onion principle here. We've got to drill down. We peel off each layer to expose what is below it. The next layer, we have drilled down and teased out the money management processes, shown what the sources of the inputs are, the various transformations, and how the funds are dispersed. The reporting side has also been covered. <coughs> now let's go on <coughs> and look at These are the individual processes within the money management process. Now we're isolating, you'll see various processes in there and you'll see with a circle there around it that the received funds process we have gone on to drill down to the next layer, taking the receive fund processes and defining the inputs, outputs, controls and resources being utilised by it. And you'll, you'll see the initial sources in the green box and the final output where we're talking about ETMs, counter transaction, electronic fund transfer and mailing in checks etc to be processed. And again, people get money out of the ATMs, they get money out of the, the counter transaction or electronic fund transfer. Sorry about this. <coughs> um, all right, sorry. <coughs> I thought I'd got to a step with the slides there. I apologize for, for that. I haven't. This is where we should be. A single process development we can see the money management process to receive funds with inputs into the managing the accounts process. We have isolated the receive funds process and can see that as inputs, outputs, controls and resources in its own right. So again, a simple four box approach as shown you in the previous slides is very demanding to keep your concentration going and drilling down into each process and co to completely define it. So, so we're going to look at an alternative approach now. We can take the work of Professor Ishikawa who developed cause and effect diagrams to solve process problems in the Japanese car industry. We'll see in the next slide how the things that have an influence on the process are defined and are used, sorry, are defined and we are going to use this as an alternative to the four box approach or at least show you another way of doing things. So we spoke about the four aims previously. This is just expanded a little bit more and we're talking about the process effectors. Think about the impacts each one of the processes, taking watch each one of the influencers in turn and see how it impacts on the process. So you can see there at the top, maintenance, manpower, methods, measurement, money, material, 
uh, machines, oh sorry, Mother Nature and machinery. These are the eight process influencers. So the definitions, the instructions provided for the tasks is under methods, materials, raw material used within the processes. Um, again, just to enlarge a little bit on the methods, they are not just what's written down, but verbal instructions given by experienced hands, supervisors or process engineers or habits that will be picked up along the way, and especially bad ones and supposed shortcuts which are often are not good. And it's how material is issued from the stores, how it's stored on the lines, transported, controlled at every stage within the process under the one that the one that you're auditing. An environmental factor which can impact on the processes, for example, temperature, humidity, noises. If there's a lot of noise going on the product uh, on the process lines, then operators can be distracted um, or noise can be a sort of health thing as well where if you're not tight about something you might not pay as much attention as you should be doing. So that's what we're meaning by noise as well as the obvious thing that noise means. If insufficient funds are available to replace equipment, or there is insufficient capacity to produce the requirements, the process will suffer. Likewise, if wages are below the accepted going rate, we'll always suffer with all sorts of associated problems. So here are the other four process factors that you saw two slides ago. Downtime, reliability, a machinery utilization, cleanliness, tool storage are all areas that have a direct impact on the process. Training, let's look at the second one, manpower there. Training, competence, utilization, attitudes and knowledge are all factors that impact on the process. If somebody doesn't have the knowledge and get their skill sets up to date, then they're not going to do the job well. Measurement. If you don't measure, you don't control. Where are the checks carried out? Are they in the right place? Is all the criteria to measure the parts known? Are they by knowledge? For example, through training during an apprenticeship or written down, an example being the critical dimensions highlighted on drawings. Sampling techniques and training in their use also come into play. This also involves the collaboration of the equipment. And the final one, maintenance. If is there a planned maintenance policy or is the equipment left till it breaks down? Our operators encouraged to clean up their workstations, take care of their tools. How competent are the engineers who maintain the equipment? Now this slide shows you a cause and effect diagram using an electronic sub-assembly and show you how a checklist can be developed, taking the things that affect the process and asking questions to verify whether it's performing as it should be. Now I've deliberately kept it to two questions per effector so that the diagram does not become too cluttered. So I'm going to take some examples because the, the writing is a little bit small. So we take materials, we can ask the question, are the correct materials being used? And we take the inference that are under measurement, two questions we could ask is what measurements are being taken, what are the process yields? And just finally as an example, machines, are the machines being used to their full capacity and how reliable are they? The first kind of process is a factory process, the second one is a business support process and the third one is the external interfaces, your suppliers and your customers.
Now these are just examples of factory processes. Assembling, cleaning, coating, inspecting, testing, machining, fabricating and welding. The business support processes, they are all the production support functions. Examples were the various departments are the maintenance department, accounting, information technology, IT, purchasing, human resources, product design and quality assurance, production planning. And the final one is the external interface processes. Typical examples are marketing, sales, customer support, finished product shipping and purchasing of equipment and raw materials. There are two process types. Continuous factory production line and the, the, trans, the two process types are continuous and transactional and examples I've given is production, a factory production line and a sales order process. There are differences. In transactional processes you can see and hear the production line running from the time it starts up but you can't see transactional processes. If you walk in an accounts office you're likely to see a number of random people sitting at computer keyboards or working with pieces of paper. Transactional processes tend to be discontinuous. The second difference is that people involved in transactional processes often choose to do bits of different processes and different instances of the same process at different times. I'm bringing this up because when you do audit, these are the kind of issues that you're going to face in transactional processes. Transactional processes are also selective in the way that sometimes progressed. Sometimes transactional processes run alongside other instances of the same process. An example I'm given dealing with a number of sales inquiries, whereas others are maybe only performed once a year. The example being preparing the annual business plan. Flow charting and auditing difficulties with transactional processes. It can be difficult when trying to produce a transactional process line or observe a transactional process and I've put in brackets system from end to end during audits. One way around this is to check completed work or work held in trays and combine sorry, combine the various steps in the process from different periods of time with your observations on the part of the process a person is currently doing. As far as flow charting is concerned, you can interview someone familiar with the process to chart it and verify each step by observing it when the person is performing the task. You can also check it together, both of you. Now that's as far as I'm going to well, now uh, I've now used up about half an hour of the time allocated to me, so um, that step one and two will take it from three to six next week. I'll now close it off and hand it back and open it up for questions on the first part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this presentation. And I want to apologize for any of the technical issues during the presentation. As I mentioned earlier, because of the time limited, we will have to conclude this presentation. If you have any questions, please write them down, and David will answer to them accordingly in the next session next week. However, if you have any questions regarding this session, you can send your questions through email and we will answer to them individually. Yet, I would highly recommend that you leave your questions for the next session on process-based auditing. Thank you again, David, for this informative and beneficial presentation. I want to thank all attendees as well for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. Please 
Check PECB's webinar schedule in our website www.pecb.com or our official social media network since next week we are organizing webinars on interesting topics. Next Monday we are hosting a webinar for part two process-based auditing. Hope to see you all there. Thank you, David. Thank you. Goodbye. Greetings everyone and welcome to this webinar. Today we will be resuming with process-based auditing part two. My name is Arta Lamani, the PECB organizer of this webinar. And the guest for today is David Smart, PECB Certified Trainer and Managing Director of Smart ISO Systems, Smart Mentoring. I feel free, please feel free, I'm sorry, to write your questions and comments in the chat box in the right hand control panel or you can use the raise hand function. We will unmute you and you will have a chance to ask the question directly. David will answer to all questions accordingly at the end of the presentation. Please David, you may resume with part two of the presentation. Thank you very much and welcome everybody, whatever time of day it is for you. So I thought because it was in two parts, what I'd like to do is do a quick recap for you on what we did last week. So we covered the first two steps in process-based auditing last week and step one, I'm going to summarize it. So we started off by defining your product. We asked the question, what is a product? And then I asked uh, quoted the ISO 9000 terms and definition um, terminology, sorry for that, uh, which is the result of a process. Then we went on to say there's four types of processes, or four kinds of processes. They are manufactured goods, processed items, software programs, and service activities. And I gave you some examples of each one. Step two in the process, we then went on to look at a worked example. And I had taken a bank process because we all use banks. Uh, it's away from manufacturing, and as I've said, the services, we all use bank services, so we're all familiar with the processes. And then we broke it down into uh, two types of service that the bank offers. It manages money and it makes loans. And the next stage in this step was to start flowchart in the processes. I began by defining and giving you a process definition. And it's a sequence of related ta tasks triggered by an event which uses resources and has influences on it. We then went on to do, look at a generic four box process model which has inputs and outputs, transformation, controls, resources. The next slide I showed you was a dairy cow whereby the green issues and everybody knows about cows so I showed you the, the one input was the milk and then I showed you the two outputs and I probably mentioned about boy racers and talking about an engine, it's exactly the same principle, only uh, an engine isn't very efficient. We then went on to talk about uh, process groups, and the definition was a number of single processes linked together, and what I tried to show you there was the internal customer concept, and about how when people do work, they shouldn't throw it over their shoulder, they should form a contract with themselves and say, would I like to receive this product, uh, this stage, in this condition? And if the answer is no, then something should be done about it. We then moved right into the bank processes and we started flowcharting the high level group of processes, which are money managing, then drilling down using an onion principle and we developed the receiving funds process. After we had done that, I'd said to you that it takes a tremendous amount of concentration to use uh, that particular model. And I moved on to taking a setup, which I quite like myself, 
which is cause and effect diagrams. They were originally developed in Japan for software programs and they're now used quite extensively for problem solving. Then we went on to talk about the process of factors and they use the ends as the headers for the cause and effect diagram. They are methods, materials, whether nature, money, money, manpower, measurement and maintenance. I gave you a worked example of a simplified cause and effect diagram with two uh, causes per header, just to simplify it, under the AM headers. The next stage was the three kinds of business processes. There's a factory, there's business support, and external interfaces with suppliers and customers. We went on then to give some practical examples of the various types of processes. Examples of a factory process are assembling, inspecting, machining. Business support processes would be maintenance, HR, and production planning. And the interface processes are product distribution, marketing, and purchasing. We then go on to speaking about the process types, which are continuous and transactional. And then we started to drill down a little bit and see what are the differences between continuous and transactional processes. And the main thing is that you can't see a transactional process in operation because of the distinct, sorry, the discontinuous steps and the operators are selective and how steps are performed. One of the easiest examples to show you might be a finance department, an accountancy department, where you go into it and you might have to do an audit and that, and it's difficult to see the process from end to end. In a continuous process in manufacturing, you start off with raw materials and you, fi you finish up with an end product. But in an accounts department, as an example, a discontinuous process, it's difficult. To, you'll not see what they're processing. They'll do a bit of this, a bit of that. They'll go back. So if you're doing an audit on a transactional process, flow, prior flow chart and by interviewing the departmental staff would be a big help. Then doing a trace back audit, checking completed work from different jobs, and checking entries, work in progress, and combining the various steps to provide you with your overall picture. That's one approach anyway. So that's me done my recap. So we'll now go on and talk about step three, which is turtle diagrams, defining the information needs. We're going to use them in defining what information is required from a process so that it functions correctly. We're going to use the information from the diagram to reduce checklists that can be used during the audit to test and verify if the processes under examination are performing as they should be. So this is the four box uh, approach to turtle diagrams, the generic one. On the top left hand box we can see what materials and equipment is used in the process. So that's a top left to top right, what competencies do the operators have and what training has been provided for them, the bottom left hand box the how, are the methods understood and well documented, and the bottom right hand box, what does the product look like, will it pass a test or an inspection, does it meet its specifications. We'll now go on and look at a worked example taking an electrical, sorry, electronic sub assembly the building of it to, to show you how to develop it. You can see what we have there is the input is a kit of parts and the output process indicator is correctly assembled sub-assembly. There are four boxes colored in yellow and the significance is 
They have had their categories expanded. For example, the materials equipment could again be broken down into materials, jigs, root card equipment, the tools, magnifiers, inspection mirrors, solder and irons, the, uh, the workstations. As you can see, the other three categories have also been broken down into the subcategories. The four brown boxes break down the process even further into its, its component parts. Sorry, I'm on. Sorry, I've got out of state there some way. That's the one you should have been looking at. I apologise. Uh, I must have jumped the slide. The process audit concept. The point here is not just to look at the procedure and compare it against the observed practice, which is a procedure or system audit. The concept of process audit is to make, take an overall look at the whole business and see how it performs. A single process is examined at a time. Always think of the customer and what the objectives of the organization are then look at the processes to see if they match with what the customer needs and what the organization's objectives are. So again, I showed you that slide too early. So in this case, with, you can see I've, I've taken an equipment checklist. We have gone stage further taking the first box from the previous slide and developed questions we could ask when we do our audit. And the process completion checklist, we can then go on and take the other three boxes, competencies, skills and training, support procedures and methods, and end with questions to check the process indicators. So we need to gather objective evidence. This is a term we use when we're determining the facts. The audit interview should be like an interview for a job. Your checklist is similar to the candidate's CV, where, where you have previously highlighted points you want to discuss with them during the interval and their, to explore further their experience and job knowledge. Now, in this slide, it shows data chunking. The term used when we're collating the facts together. As we go along during our audit, you'll be gathering facts. These build together and show a much bigger picture. By analyzing the facts you've gathered, you will see patterns and trends emerging. Where you sh the trend, you'll see the trends where they will show you there's a general breakdown, not just in one process, but across many processes. It snowballs, the knock-on effects on one process from themselves and other processes. These trends may be trends you've seen before from other audits, or they may be new ones. Now the next slide will show you the bigger picture after you've gathered the data. So we see there in the jig area, a number of jibs are observed to be dismantled and others had parts missing from them. Five jigs dismantled and 14 had parts missing. This is to demonstrate that equipment is not being routinely maintained. That's overall trend. The next one is there were six fluorescent tubes not working out of 30 in the production line one. It's an all. Out of 30. 65s are 30, that's 20%. There were a significant number of service requests raised this month for equipment breakdowns, 20. A portable appliance station had not been done in the last year on farms used to cool the operators. There were five instances found during the audit. It's important to st stress again to remember that during the audit you're only taking samples. So the statistics come into it and sometimes I get debates about, oh you were lucky, you got the ones that were wrong, the rest are okay. Uh, and I say, look, I can say to you statistically that the sample represents the lot as a whole. 
and often I'll find, like to do records as well, they'll sort the ones that I've identified and then they'll say it's clear, sorted, I'll go back and take another sample and I'll find out they've not even looked at anything. And the final one, the operators thermometer used to test the soda bar temperature was not in the calibration scheme. The above findings are arrived at by analysing and data chunking of the facts and shows examples of similar problems, lack of routine maintenance manifesting itself in more than just one area. I will now go on to talk about your report. Not so much really during internal audits, but if you're doing second party audits or third party audits, then the report is one of the main, main things. You won't particularly raise non-conformance individual reports. You'll list the number of majors and write them up, um, whereas in internal audits, they tend to be single uh, non-conformance reports which you circulate. So the first heading up here is be precise. And it's important that you make your most important point first to grab their attention. Have the facts to hand. Support your claims with supporting evidence. Other by photo sorry, photocopied documentation or summarizing your copious notes you've taken during interviewing the people what they call oddities. And these days you could even take photographs with a mobile phone, assuming of course that you're allowed to uh, take your mobile phone into the company under the data protection, the 27,001, there may be issues in there and you may be asked to leave your phone at the front door. Keep your composure, composure, sorry. Remain calm and don't be drawn into projected discussions. You're only there to present the evidence, not offer suggestions on how to sort the problem. You should know the procedures inside out and also know the requirements of a particular standard that under, that's under audit. Be firm but fair. If you've got it wrong and we all end up with getting egg in our face and the company's representatives might present additional evidence that you didn't see at the time at the closing meeting, then accept it and hold your hand up and admit it. Don't try to waffle your way off it. Your credibility will be damaged if you do. Say your piece and close the meeting. It's not a debate in society. As an auditor, you should know if there's a non-conformance. So should they. If they are present, sorry, if you have presented your evidence in a non-biased way, then it should be self-evident. You're not there to get in a point scoring session. And the closing meeting should only last between 20 minutes, sometimes no even that. So that gives you an idea how long. The opening meeting in the morning, and maybe a quarter of an hour. So we're on to step six now. Investigate to find the root cause, not just treat the symptoms. Big, big thing here. All too often the audit findings are given the minimum attention to clear them down. I mentioned on a previous slide about documentation, about them only uh, looking at the ones I've found. One way to help get to the bottom of the problem and stop it recurring is to use the five why technique. So we'll take an example of a postman. Why was a postman late in delivering my mail this morning? He had too many letters to deliver. Why? Because there used to be two postmen doing the round. Why? Well, in this country, we talk about the Royal Mail. They went on an economy drive because it was losing money. Why? Pressure's been put on it by the government to make it profitable. 
And the fifth why, it's a politically sensitive issue. Now, next one. Training investment. Training budgets are usually the first thing that gets cut in tough economic times. There is an attitude of, I'm not going to spend money on training people. They will leave and get a better job. This is a full economy. Firstly, all you have to do is to make it more attractive for them to stay or build a clause in their contract to say, you've got to stay here for two years. Also, a lot of training can be done in-house. I'm a big believer in in-house training. Invest in, <clears throat> in training your managers to train their staff is very cost effective. I just did an audit the other week there in the deprived area and they wanted to do 80% of their in-house training and I suggested that they, train, they send their managers on a training for trainers course to assist them because I know what like it was myself when I was trying to train people initially. I did all right at it, but I was not a trained trainer. And after I took that training for trainers course, I would like to think that I improved an awful lot. Again, purchasing books, videos are all low cost. Okay, books can be dear, but in relationship to the amount of training and knowledge that they can provide, they're a cheap resource. It starts with a change in attitude of a manager's role. The old style management was about controlling and directing. Now, it's very much about coaching and mentoring. Now, a lot of managers don't have coaching and mentoring skills. I've never seen a good appraisal system ever any time I've done audits. The manager will not accept the responsibility or his responsibility to develop his staff. It too often gets into an unstable situation right from the get-go. So you're on the defensive, if you're the one that's getting your review, your appraisal, and your manager's acting as judge, jury, and executioner, where he's, he should be taken, he should have done a jobs needs analysis, he should have been able to put a training plan together, and if he didn't have the skill sets his cell, he, sh he should have either gone for training, for training to get these skills, or arrange for somebody else to do it for instance, another manager or an external agency. This is an improvement opportunity. The idea is to save money, making the processes more efficient. A costing system driven by the accounts function should be put in place to standardize and cost of savings made in any area is that the processes are deficient. <coughs> so what are the conclusions? I don't know what's happened there. Right. Sorry about that. And that's the final part of it. And now the conclusions. Firstly, you have to understand the business processes you're going to audit. And I did that recap today, telling you what businesses are we in. Now under ISO 9001 2015, it's very much about fitting the particular standard into the organization and looking at strategic planning, maybe looking at SWOT analysis, pestle analysis, or ways of determining the, how the strategic and operational direction of the company is tied together and then aligning the management operational goals were the strategic goals. Next, you have to gather the objective evidence of how the processes have been controlled. Whatever method you use, whether it be the turtle diagrams, the cause and effect, or just get into checklists, or whatever, hopefully today I've given you a lot more idea on how to break down, which is often especially in the early stages, it's quite daunting when you see a whole process, especially if you're not familiar with it. 
And finally, you must present your findings in a manner that shows how the various strengths and weaknesses impact on the business that you're auditing. Shown a balanced picture. It's all too easy to be a zealot and say this is wrong, the next thing's wrong. You're not there when you're doing auditing. You should be impartial. You're not there to impart your opinions. You're only there to say, does it meet the requirements of a particular standard you're looking at? Now, you don't even need to like the method or whatever you see. You might have a preference just sell for something else. You can put that in a recommendation if you want. That's up to you. But you're certainly not there to say, well, if this was my process, this is how I'd be running it. That is categorically, categorically wrong. And that is a recipe for disaster. <clears throat> because when they do things, if you offer suggestions, then the, the people that you've audited will turn around and say, I can't win with you. I've done what you said I had to do, and I've still not got it right. So you cannot offer opinions. You're only there to gather the objective evidence and say to yourself, does this meet the requirements of the standard? And also, I've showed you how to uh, take various uh, clunks of data and put them together to show trends, which is a very, very uh, effective way of doing it. So that's my presentation finished. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time. And I've given you my email address if you would like to email me with questions. But I'll now use the rest of, of the time allocated to me to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this presentation. I want to apologize for the technical issues during the presentation. Now we will take questions. Therefore, if you have any questions, it's time to ask them. Please use the comment box or the raise hand option. I have here already someone that raised their hand, Stefani Diaz. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. Stefani, can you hear me? You can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, his mic is not working. I'll just read the question out and I'll try and answer it. It's unfortunately, it's not written, it's only... Oh, sorry. That's okay. Well, you can ask me by email then, if that's the case. He's got my email. Okay, and I have another hand raised, Herstina. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. Herstina, if you can hear me, go ahead. Please unmute your mic, Herstina, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay. We can move on to the questions. Another question. Since their mics seem to not be working, we have a question here. When it comes to performance focuses and not just conformity, what does management need to know? The whole point in the order is to provide information that management need to know. When I used to be a manager or a supervisor, I used to dread audits, and generally speaking, people see the negative side of them. And I used to say things like, I'm in this area every day. I don't need you to tell me how this area is running. But in actual fact, I was wrong. Because you're going to, and that's another point when you're auditing as well, don't just take the manager's opinion and what he says, ask the people that are actually doing the job because you will find that what's written and how they're doing it might be two different things. So the, the point is that you as an auditor need to, and that's one of the weaknesses in the auditing, that they tend to be orientated around procedures which we're moving away from now. And it's Again, the role of the management representative has been knocked out the standards because of this issue that I've just talked about. And a lot 
at a time audit and was very narrow. So the idea now is very much to tie it in to how a business is performing at all levels. So any data that any particular departmental manager wants, how is, it, is his department performing? What's the competency of his staff? How is he aligning his own objectives with um, the strategic ones? How does he do pest analysis? Has he had a look at the corporate plan? How often is it updated? These are all things that they should be looking at and tying the operational issues in with the strategic issues. It's much wider than just a quality control system where you're looking at problems on the line. And again, in my own life, I mean, I worked for a big electronics company, and when we got faults on the line, we used to trail bar, go to the supervisor. Supervisor and I went up the line, got the particular operator, and say, pay more attention. That was a complete waste of time, because that was just treating the symptoms. No investigations were done. If the operators have not been trained properly, or they've been provided with the wrong drawn, or the equipment has got the wrong program in it, or whatever, then it's no problem with the operator. The 80-20 rule applies here. 80% of problems in a business are management issues, not employee level. And that's where cause and effect diagrams and the tools of quality, the 7QC tools, can all help and identify improvements. But the onus is also on the management team to use the management review to bring up issues that they have in their own departments, feed it in, and then use the audits to gather the information to assist them on solving the problems. And again, uh, very seldom do I see the FAP model, the failure appraisal and prevention model on costing uh, invoked at all. And often, uh, on that score, it would be a very good way of involving the accountancy department, because in a lot of cases, the accountancy department are totally against systems, because you're challenging the reporting system. And again, it's about moving away a business from the financial model. I mean, I hear people talking about the only purpose of a business is, is to make money. That is not true these days. There are many. If you're not a good corporate citizen, then you're not going to be in business very long. Now that's me beginning to drift a little bit. Uh, there may well be other questions, so I'll stop there. And if I can have another question, please. Yes, we have another question. A hand is raised by Nimot. Nimot, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And if it works, otherwise I'll just read your question. I have unmuted you, and you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you for the presentation. I basically want to ask about um, audit reporting. So most times I use Excel spreadsheets. And looking at your presentation, are they basically present, uh, prepared in Microsoft Word, or do you have tools you use to evaluate audit performance? Like sometimes I compare my quarterly audits to see the performance of the projects. Are there specific tools you use apart from Microsoft uh, spreadsheets that I used to use? Are there other smart tools that I can use? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, thank you for the, your comments about my presentation. Excel is good for what if scenarios, and it's good enough for presenting charts, etc., etc. But there's a big movement now towards electronic capture of the data, and they've even talked about big data. So in the, the days of paper manuals for procedures and that, in fact, there, there's a movement away from documenting things down and putting much more emphasis on the auditor to find out how things are getting done. So they've got to use methods like triangulation, where they go and talk to the operatives. But any of the seven quality control tools is a good start. 
uh, control chart and techniques, histograms for heat analysis type of thing. If you go on the internet, um, you you can get write ups on on that and bring in use of stats in, into uh, your auditing. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about records taking samples of records, but sampling, uh, looking at that, the sample size against the batch size, control chart and techniques. Um, I mean, I've used um, control chart and techniques for training, for example, the three sigma, how long people are doing certain tasks and seeing if it's outside the three sigma and things like that. So there's all sorts of tools that you can use and if you go on the internet and download, they'll give you worked examples or if you email me, I'll send you some stuff on it and show you examples that I've put together. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Could you give an example of a continuous and transactional process? Well, I'll just be repeating myself, but a continuous process would be like a manufacturing plant where the raw materials are issued on a, a production line. And the production line has stages where an operator or a group of operators will assemble parts. Then it will move through the process and there will be various inspection stages. Then there will probably be an end of line inspection. Then it will, might go for testing. And then after it's tested, then it's finally accepted and boxed up and put in a distribution area ready to send to the customer. That's an example of a continuous process. Or you could have a situation in the oil industry where you're uh, totally automated the whole process. That would be a continuous process. Uh, the, exa the other example of the transactional analysis I used was I took the accounts function, but you, you could have taken any admin function. Now when you go in and see the office manager or a personnel department, and say a bigger company, there's six personnel assistants. I'll move away from accounting and look at personnel. There's six personnel assistants all doing various tasks. Now you've got to find out if the personnel department is operating as a whole. So it's not as if they're going to do like the manufacturing side where all the operations have come one after the other. They might work for half an hour on job applications. Then they might go on and write an HR procedure. Whatever the tasks of the department are, they'll be doing different things. And they'll put, maybe put them in an entry uh, or start something else or prioritize their work. So you're not seeing a process from end to end, but you've got to check the process from end to end. So what I said was one way of doing it is to uh, take particular tasks that they're doing, and if you're lucky enough where somebody hands over work to somebody else to do the next stage of it, for, that, for instance, hand it to the supervisor to check their work, then you've got two processes but the back but you certainly won't have the full process all at once in front of you. So the next day then is to look maybe in an entry and look at work it's held in an entry and check the stages. There might be three or four steps already done. So you can trace back from the steps that are already completed to the start of the job. So you're combining various jobs at different times, I mean, it might take, I mean, a job application might take a month or something like that to totally process. You've only got a day to check it, so you do little steps at a time. So you, you, you look at finished uh, completion applications, look at how they're recorded, that type of thing. Look at the partly done work and the tree um, on the desk might be three trays in, a wait and start and pending and completed. So there's a good source for you to 
uh, look at the various steps in the process and then you go around the office and talk to various people, as I said, about triangulating the process and see if they're all doing it the same way and also you might see another part of the same process when you go around to the next operator. I hope I've been clear there, I've certainly tried to be. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question, which is, as you said, represent the finding is objective evidence, not a suggestion. In many cases, when NCs present, client says, what is the best way to resolve? Kindly share what is the best answer at that time. Now, as I said, you're digging a hole for yourself if you use phrases like, well, if it was me it was in charge of it, I would do this, this, and this. But, in a lot of instances, especially in smaller organizations, the knowledge or the standard is very limited due to lack of training. Now, you have actual live examples to show them why there's a nonconformance. So sometimes I leave myself a little open and I might give them two or three ways that they might want to look at it. So I use it as a training exercise, but strictly speaking, you're not there to offer them advice. You're not in the advice game. They should know what the problem is, and it's up to whoever's responsible for completing the corrective actions that they do it properly. And if once you do closed loop control, which, which is it finally gets brought to the quality representative, and he checks all the various completion details, for example, let's assume you get the situation I was speaking about, about the documentation, and you get it back, and the three things the auditor can do, you can accept the rework that they've done, I, I know that person knows what they're doing, I don't need to go and check their work, you can leave it to the next time you do that audit, or you can go back and have a snap check and see where it is. Now, if it slips through the auditor and it just signs it off and doesn't fully check it, then when it finally gets to the QA representative, he should be looking at the whole, every section of the form. For instance, I've actually got this all written up, so if you email me, I'll give you uh, a completed um, work example of a non-conformance report, an internal audit non-conformance report. In the first question on it is, have all the details been documented properly? Now that is not easy to do. You've only usually got, say, maximum an inch and a half on a piece of paper to document what the problem is. Okay, you can put additional notes clipped on the back, showing the evidence, etc., etc. There's all sorts of things you can do, photographs, etc. But it's not to be un underestimated that writing up the non-conformance report is not so easy. And again, when you're writing it up, it should be in, couch it in the terms of the standard. If you can't couch it in the terms of the standard you're auditing, then you don't have a non-conformance. And again, there are various clauses in the standard you can log non-conformances against. L log the one that has, has the strongest case for you. Um, oh, I could give you loads of examples, but I don't want to get bogged down here. So it's about looking at each section. Is it documented correctly? Have the follow-ups up action solved the problem? And finally, the closed actions, which is the closed loop control system. You both walk the line for yourself and check, take a sample. If you're the quality representative, just to test it out for yourself, or you might even ask the auditor to go and have a, a sample check, say a month later, to see that, that it's working properly. Walk the line yourself, check the documentation, and then sign it off. If there's a, a weakness in there, for instance, if the documentation has been properly recorded, then you need to do a training session. Say on the corrective actions, if either the person that's been audited these corrective actions have they solved the problem, and I spoke to you about quick fixes, and I talked to you about root cause analysis, 
the COPA uh, corrective and preventive option, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these are the, I the issues, <coughs> but the root cause is training or apathy could they care less. So hopefully that answers that question. Thank you. The next question is, can you please tell what is the best way to present NCs with clear objective evidence to top management? Well, it doesn't matter, in my view, whether it's top management, middle management, or bottom level management. But as I've said already to you, <clears throat> what you're trying to do is get away from trivia. Single instance is something happening. I showed you an example of how maintenance wasn't getting done, not just in one area, but throughout the company, various sources where you're taking your data from. Looking for trends so that you can present them to the management team with objective evidence. Now, it's fairly easy when you're talking about documentation because you can say, Here's, you can take copies of what you found wrong. If a form details, there's details missing, then it's fairly easy to take photocopies and highlight the areas where the, 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 either the information's not uh, as full as it might be, or it's missing altogether. And then taking a worked example of the essential details that are needing to be required on a form and compare them, show them to management with the objective evidence. But when you're talking about working practices, I've got mixed feelings about this, but more and more we're getting into surveillance systems on, well, I'm speaking about manufacturing more than service industries, but I've seen many cases for instance, when I was in Canada, uh, the guy was reworking Nintendo units and things like that. And part of the contract was he, he, he had to install CCTV because it's theft and things like that. Now, it may be possible to look at recording an individual operator, their working practices, and either preparing a little short video and that's easy enough to do these days with a tablet and say this is how it should be done and here's how it has been done. Whether you could actually take a little video and observe that is just interviewing the guy, I don't know if at this moment in time, especially in a unionized shop, whether that would cause a problem or not. It all depends on the culture in the organization. If it's a blame culture, then no but if it's a bit more enlightened, where it's seen as an opportunity for improvement and the person is getting an opportunity to do it correctly, because there's nobody wants to do a job badly. Nobody comes in and says, oh, I screwed up my supervisor yesterday, I, I, I made six faults, I'll go for ten today. Nobody thinks like that. Most of the problems, as I've said, is 80-20 rules. It's a management's problem because the person has not been trained in properly in the first place. Or they're in a job that they don't like, or motivation, uh, tedious work. Or, it's up to the supervisor to think of ways to try and get the motivation within the team other than a bonus system. Uh, very much now we're moving towards self-managed groups and it tends to be more group bonus systems now, the old work study days and that are uh, hopefully by. But that would be my approach to it. If, if I, if I, as I say, documentation is pretty easy to solve and it's, it's no personal, but on the, tri on the actual observed practice, getting the objective evidence, as I say, it depends on the cultural organization I've seen instances where they've often used videos to record times and that, to look, look at single exchange of dies and things like that, and they've got all the, the actual, uh, and I used to do that for a job about talking norms, and saying this is a norm for the job, 
and agreeing the norms of how long it would take and establishing criteria, workmanship standards to match up and the methods. I'm beginning to go on a bit now, so I'm stopping there. Hello? Yes, thank you. Uh, another question we have is, what does documented information stand for in the new version standard 2015? Thank you. Now, you're talking about ISO 9001, but Annex SL is the, that's the high level, uh, all documentation will be against that Annex SL now. And what they've done now is we used to have record control and document control. But because of the electronic, the movement towards electronic medium now, they've decided that you can use any medium to hold documents on. Whatever that may be, it, it can be forms, electronic forms, for instance, a database. Some people have problems with understanding that a database, the input screen is actually a form. So whatever format you use to hold that information, and then obviously from the record side of it, again, you can, I mean, then say customer service department, there will be maybe a software program, or I was at that one I did last week where they were doing coupons and recording the customer complaints there. So whatever, the, the, there's a huge movement now to the days of paper copies of documents are getting pretty well. Like now we're moving much more towards data capturing. And I found out many years ago that the IT manager's job and my job as a quality manager was exactly the same. We were developing systems. So that is where, the, if you download the matrix uh, on ISO 9001, the correlation matrix, or again, if you want to email me, I'll, I'll, photo, I'll do as an attachment for you. But if you go on the internet, you'll get a correlation matrix and it'll I'll show you both ways of doing it. It takes the 2015 standard and lists the clauses down one side, and then the other side it shows you the 2000, the equivalent clause in the 2008 version. Then at the back of that, it switches it over. Um, actually, I've said that the wrong way around, but it's the same principle. The 2000, Annex C, uh, or sorry, the first part of the Annex, it gives you the 2008 clause and then gives you the equivalent clause in the 2015 standard. And then at the back of that, it gives you the, the 2015 version and the equivalent clause in the 2008. So you've got it both ways. So that basically answers that question, I think. Thank you. Because of the time limited, we have to conclude this presentation. However, if you have any other questions, you can send your questions through email and we will answer to them individually. Thank you again, David, for this informative and beneficial presentation. I want to thank all the attendees as well for taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us and your patience with this two-parted webinar. We hope you enjoyed the complete webinar. Please check PECB's webinar schedule in our website www.pecb.com or our official social media network, since next week we are organizing webinars on interesting topics. Next Monday we are hosting a webinar on the topic, Corrective Action or Preventive Action, the new risk-based mythology for ISO 9001-2015. Thank you. Also from me, it was my pleasure in doing this presentation. I really enjoyed it, and it's enlightening for me to get questions at the end because it shows that there's an interest there. So thank you very much once again, and bye. Bye-bye.